Amen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Numbers, <laughs> chapter 13. In, in our en English vocabulary, there, is, there are a handful of words that can change the entire context of a sentence, a conversation, even the outcome of an entire situation. And what I'm going to read about, I've got, I've got a couple of texts I want to read about. I'm in no hurry. Y'all in any hurry? Yes, it's the word nevertheless. Everybody say nevertheless. nevertheless. In the New Testament Greek, Luke's writings, the word nevertheless is used, and I'm going to quote from Thayer's Greek lexicon, uh, after negative sentences and serves to mark a transition into something new. In the book of Mark, nevertheless is used in, as an opposition to concession. In other words, I wanted to give up, but nevertheless, I'm going to do what you told me to do which is let down the net. This simply means that although the speaker does not want to yield, doesn't want to concede to a circumstance, they have submitted their own will through the power of one word. Everybody say nevertheless. nevertheless. Finally, from the American Heritage Dictionary, the word simply means in spite of all that. No matter what happened, in spite of all that, we'll do this. Luke chapter 18, verse 8, the scripture says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? I think these kind of testings kind of prove our faith, that we're going to have faith to get through, to press through. You know, many of you guys have been through far more than what we have with these floods. You've been through things in life, and it just it happens. So every, every now and then, we need a nevertheless. Can I get an amen? amen? So in this story, Numbers chapter 13, which is a, a sad one, Numbers 13, the spies go over into the promised land. Moses sends them out. They've been... Uh, uh, God has helped evict them from Egypt. They're moving through. They're looking for this place. And as the scripture says in verse 23, And they came into the brook of Eshka, cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. Numbers 13, 23. And they bear it between, between, uh, uh, two, uh, between two people upon a staff. One, one branch, one cluster of grapes. Two men to carry it. They brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the, book, the brook Eshka. Because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel had cut down from thence. And they returned from searching out the land for 40 days. So 40 days they are over there. They're eating grapes. They're checking out the cows. Remember what they said? It was a land that flowed with milk and honey. So we found the bees. We found the cows. This is an amazing place. We've been in Egypt. We've been struggling. We've barely been. Now we get to this place in between. I've often called it the land of just enough. Because they were getting by with manna that God was sending to them. But when they got on the promised land, it was the most amazing place. It's that search that, that people have for Eureka. It's that search that people have for the, for the gold mines and all of that. They found these giant grapes. They found cattle. They found uh, um, uh, honey. They found the, all the things that could bless you. It's a good time. And they went and they came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel and the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. They brought back word to them unto all the congregation, showed them the fruit of the land. They told him and he said, we came into the land where you sent me and surely it flowed with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Verse 28. Nevertheless. The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, uh, all the, the Canaanites, the Termites, they all there, amen, by the coast of Jordan. Caleb, Caleb stilled. He silenced the people before Moses and said, let's go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Now listen, Moses never asked them. Tell me your opinion on whether we can take the land. That was never asked. He said, what's over there? Well, they came back, said there's milk, there's honey, there's giant grapes the size of grapefruit. And by the way, the giants are over there, and we don't think we can take it. Then John and Caleb said, oh, I didn't know we were voting. Because if we voting, let me vote too. We are well able to take the land. God will help us do that. But his vote and Joshua's vote was silenced by these ten. And all of a sudden, a negative report removed. And this is what hits me a lot of times in churches and businesses and life. is how quick we can become negative and it starts flowing through the place. And it, one affects the other and one affects And it starts moving through and that's what happened here. But when the men that went up with them said, we're not able to go up against the people for they're stronger than we are. And they brought up an evil report of the land. Hang on. First you said it was good, but now the people there. Now you're saying it's evil. 
which had searched the children of Israel, saying, The land which we have gone to search it, the land that it eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people we saw in it were men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come from the giants. You remember, they're there 40 days. They're checking it out. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And we were there, so we were in their sight. They thought because you thought I was, I thought in my mind I was little. Then evidently you think I'm little too. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You know, I've been around some big guys before, but I've never felt bi uh, uh, any smaller around them. It doesn't have to be that way. So here in this situation, when David fought Goliath, David ran out on the field. The Bible says David ran toward Goliath. You know, you know, you've got to understand the height of Goliath versus David. And here goes this teenage boy running toward Goliath. And somebody yelled, David, don't go. That giant's too big. That giant's too big to hit. And David said, no, he's too big to miss. Yeah, yeah. Wow. At times in life, it's your perspective. It's how you see it. If, if, watch, if I was out on that property, and it's just a couple of families, and we had no help, it would be overwhelming. But to see what I saw yesterday, did you know we even had Muslims show up yesterday and offer to help? Did you know the Latter-day Saints showed up who were are with our camps and stuff? They showed up to help. They worked. Did you know there's a guy on Channel 13... Art Rascal, Art Rascon, Art Rascon was tearing sheetrock out of my house. Yeah. Amen. I mean, as long as you got people showing up, people that are for something, you can get it done. Can I get an amen? amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for an opportunity to share. Take it and penetrate our hearts. God, we don't need a sermon. We need something that has some life to it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I hope you're shoulder to shoulder. If you follow the story of the 12 spies, you're going to discover that to a man, every one of them experienced the greatness of Canaan, the wonder of it. It wasn't just Joshua and Caleb that pulled down a bunch of grapes. It wasn't just Joshua and Caleb that ate the fruit of the land. It was all of them that ate. They all enjoyed that. But all of a sudden, they have this positive going. Everything's going. We got milk. We got honey. We got grapes. We got a tremendous place over there. We can take this as positive, but one word, nevertheless, shifted it into a negative. And that's how some people, bless their heart, they can't, it just seems like they cannot see the good in things. You know, and, and when I look over the, our, like our property, when I see many things that I saw, I saw good in it. There's still good coming from it. Can I get an amen? We, we're going to make through this. It's, it's not going to be the end of the world for any of us. So however, in the 10 spies, that nevertheless shifted everything. They witnessed God's promises, but couldn't trust his protection. They saw big giants and, you know, we sing that song, I will trust in you. Uh, beautiful, Tony. But I'm just telling you, as I'm saying, I'm going, now come on. Do we got to again? And it's going to be our whole life. It's been my anthem. Love people, trust God. Amen. And if I can keep trusting him and believing him, it's all going to be all right. Can I get an amen? amen. I'm kind of like Josiah from glory to glory. Lord, bring us on, on up. They saw big giants. They felt they had a little God. So wherein Caleb had a great big God, and he saw little giants. Fear robs us of our own perspective. Fear brings out the worst. It ushers in complaining, distrust, finger pointing, despair. It's an army of giants, fear. It multiplies one into many. I know when the waters start coming up, my, my, you know, I, of course, I, I want to be there like I was last time, but the, the bottom line is this. You, you, God will, this, this hit me really hard when I'm out on the road. One day I won't be there. One day I'm not going to be there. And you have to figure it out. And my boys have to figure it out. And whoever's left there got to figure it out. Amen. And I'm so proud of how they figured it out. They got things done. Put the, I mean, I, probably better than me being there trying to make suggestions. But there's just something about knowing that, that in life, you're going to have to trust him. God, you know, God did not lead them to that point just to lead them. It was not God getting them there for them to say, well, you know, if only. And that's what they started. If only we went back to Egypt. If only we had the leeks. If only we had the onions. Do you know, I, I used to call these people the, the, the uh, uh, what did I call the bunch of, they, they cry babies. They said, we, we don't like in here. Uh huh. We don't like the pews. We don't like the carpet. Pastor, we miss the deer heads on the wall. Can we bring the deer heads over and put them on the wall? Yeah, I don't, we don't like it here. If people get this attitude about life, and they get to a certain place, and they get whining, because that's what they did. They wanted the onions. They wanted the leeks. They wanted the garlic. If you, you know, when, when, you eat, when you eat onions, you cry. 
When you eat garlic, you make everybody around you cry. <laughs> the, the, these were those people. 85% of the spies used the power of nevertheless. Just that one word to change a positive. We saw it into a negative. We can't do this. Their attitude was, yes, there's plenty of promise in the land. And, and that, that, that we spied out. But in spite of all that, we can't do it. I've said this for years. 40 years. Four, they took 40 days to look around. 40 years before they could get into the promised land. And this was God's promise to you. Because you're doubtful. Because you don't believe. Because you don't think I can take care of giants and anything else in that land that, that's squatting on your property. If you, you realize that, I promise you, you no one of you is going to see the promised land. You're all going to have to die except for Joshua and Caleb. They were punished along for 40 years. And I'm telling you, in my heart, I believe they're the only two smiling at every funeral. Yeah. Every time one of them men died, I could see them looking around and going, you know what? When, when old Fred dies, we can get in the promised land. He's the last one of the whole bunch right there. <laughs> hey, Amen. ain't getting until they all go. There's also a way to turn a negative into a positive. In Luke's recording of the miracle of the fishes, we, and we can experience the power of nevertheless changing things. Luke's 5, you've heard me preach on this a lot. Now when he had left speaking, Jesus is in the boat. Remember that? He's out there. They, Peter's fished all night. James and John's fished all night. He's out inside the boat there, and he's speaking, and he speaks to Simon Peter, and he said, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Now watch, it says launch out in the deep, which tells me that they were so close to shore that he could speak just like I am right now to you. But then the fish ain't right here at the shallow. So we got to go further out in the deep. So all of a sudden, as they got deeper into the water, further out of the water, he said, let down the net. And Peter complained. He said, Lord, we worked all night. We've been cleaning our nets all, night, all morning. There ain't no fish here. You're a preacher. We're fishermen. You keep preaching. We keep fishing. Comprehende? <laughs> Jesus said, let down your net. Let down your nets for a drought. And then Peter says one word that turned a negative into a positive. The word was? Say it again. Turn that thing around. Lord, we work all night long, but nevertheless, we're going, to, we're going to make this happen. And at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed such a great multitude of fishes that their net break. I believe that there's a nevertheless in every one of us about life. Sometimes things start going a little bit sour. They start going a little bit down and a little bit negative. But if I can shift my thinking, my attitude, and my trust in God by saying nevertheless. He just spent the morning cleaning those, those nets. He was a fisher by trade. He knew the waters. His own expertise told him there was no reason to try again. That's why when the fish came up and they counted them 153, he said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a wicked man. He knew that if God could look into the water and see the fish, he could look inside of him. And God sees our heart. He sees our fear. He sees our turmoil. He sees our gossip, our criticism, our meanness. He sees it inside of us, and we want to push away from it. The best place I could be on a Sunday morning was right here on this front row. Having my hands up, knowing you go behind us, and there's just something about being here. And I think to myself, God, what would happen if you go through these type of uh, uh, calamities and tragedies, and you ain't got a family, you ain't got God, you ain't got a nevertheless on your lips. How are you going to make it? This is why I want to see us reach people. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 You, you can't, I've heard this say it over and over. First off, when we first, 16 years ago, you can't revive this camp. This thing is run down. Nevertheless, we did. Then Harvey hit and said, what are we going to do now? We ain't got no insurance. Somebody said, nevertheless, we did. This time, oh, thank you, Jesus. We ain't got insurance on most of the buildings, but we do on the church, my house, the office, and the cafeteria. Somebody say, Nevertheless. I don't know how all that works. It sounds like a lot of bureaucracy to me. But one way or another, it just simply means we, we've done the best we can. And something's going to, it, we're going to get a little extra help as we move. We're not going to break the bank. Like, hopefully, thank you, Jesus, that we don't do that again. You can't start another church. You already got one out here in the woods. You can't start another church. Ain't no, you can't come back over here to Crosby. You can't be back over here. Did you know that the Crosby Ministry Alliance voted to have the Thanksgiving service here in this church? Come on. Amen. For Thanksgiving, that Sunday night, that is a blessing. Amen. You know what that is? That's affirmation and validation. Amen. Amen. Welcome back. Somebody say, nevertheless. Amen. 
Amen. You, you can't rebuild the church and the camp. Yeah, well, you watch us. However, Simon Peter used this word, nevertheless. It's kind of like you're looking at somebody. Real, they're not going to change their mind. So I'm just going to say nevertheless and flow right on in with them. Simon Peter used that. You see, Simon had tasted futility. Is that me? Futility, but trusted in the faithfulness. Once again, Lord, we worked these waters all night long and haven't caught the last thing. Let me tell you, we, we've worked these waters, but we ain't caught one thing. We're going to keep working the waters. We're going to keep believing God for your children, your parents, amen, your friends, that God bring them, connect them, put them in a Bible-believing church somewhere. Can I get an amen? Going to stay on it. It was this nevertheless that in the Greek word actually served to mark a transition to something new. It was here that Jesus called his disciples. It was at that moment. And I said this before. I'll say it again. Why did Jesus pick Peter who was presumptuous, sword-toting, ear-slicing, mouthy, struggled with forgiveness? You know, you would think Jesus would put disciples together who liked each other. You think he would put them together who had the same taste in motorcycle? Or at least fish. I, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, boats. You know, he would put those guys. But he didn't. He put a tax collector, Matthew, in there. He grabbed a guy named Judas who betrayed him and another guy named Judas who was a, uh, a Roman who hated tax collectors. Then he got two brothers, James and John, and you know our siblings love each other. Then he throws Peter in the mix, and he picks Pete. This is the calling of the disciples. And the question has always been, why, why, why Peter? And the answer has to be as simple as, because he had a boat. And in your life, you're going to find out, Ronnie, the reason God uses you, sir, is you decided to use your boat. In life, it's about you using your boat. It's about you saying, God, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you my uh, abilities, my skills, all the things you've blessed me with. It's yours. And then God says, okay, now I can use you. Amen. I can take that right there. You come on in here. You're good with electronics and this, that, and, and Wi-Fi, all this new stuff. Those are gifts and boats. Amen. It's this generation. So you get, and if you don't, Peter, want me to use your boat, I'm going to ask James and John if I can use theirs. Then there had been 11 disciples. Right? So he, here's, you, 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 when you watch Jesus and watch how he works and how, watch how he deals with people, and he puts them together, again, and I, and I may not be able to keep this going in life, I've never fired anyone. I've been an employer for 27 years. I've never fired anyone. But I've, I've given folk enough rope to leave, hang themselves, whatever. Even I've left. <laughs> Hello? The bottom line is this. People, because of the grace of God, can learn to get along, work together. They have to be that way. I have to believe that. And if God moves them, that's fine. But, but the bottom line is, I don't want to be the one that always walks around and oh, I, I can't get rid of this and get rid of this. I, I, I've never been that attitude. I've always felt like God was merciful on me and blessed me. So why can't I do that for others? Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lead not on your own understanding. But nevertheless, if you tell me to throw it out, I'll throw it out. Now, see, this would be one thing if I realized that the book of Numbers said it, if I saw Peter and Jesus doing it. But what you really want to see is the man himself do it. So Jesus gets to the end of his life, and the book of Matthew, excuse me, we'll be in Mark. It's also in Matthew, Luke, and John picks up on it. But Mark 14, and he went a little further, and he fell on, his, on the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father. You know, that word has to deal with adoption, that we adopted into this body. Amen. That God puts us and connects us here. All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. What's the word? Nevertheless. Say it again. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Uh, and then he goes out and he finds his disciples sleeping. And he said unto Peter, Simon, you're sleeping. Why could you not watch with me an hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is truly is, is, is ready, 
The flesh is weak. And again, he went away and he prayed the same words. Gethsemane, my friend, of course, is a place of pressure. You know, as a matter of fact, when he went into the garden, he brought who? Pete, James, and John. Again, his favorite clique, Pete and JJ. And he sets them down on the side of the garden. He says, guys, pray. I got to deal with something. He goes in. He kneels down. He begins to talk to the Father. And he begins to realize that I have to give up. my. Not just. It ain't going to be a quick death. The blood that's encased inside this flesh is going to flow out of my body. And that blood is for a propitiation. It's for the forgiveness. It's for the covering of sin. And he talks to the Father about it. And then he realizes this is going to be painful. And he said, Lord, if you will. Let this pass from me. Let the death of my family members pass from me. I don't want to deal with it. Let me go first. Then God says, no, I'm going to keep you around and you got to deal with it. Let this tragedy, this flood pass from me. And he said, no, I'm going to let you go through that. Lord, let this, this, this the divorce that's breaking my heart, let it pass from me. He said, no, you're going to have to get through this thing. All these things and realize the sins of man. It wasn't just his blood leaving. It was the sins being poured on. The sins of the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. The sins of, of men murdering one another and, and abusing children. And all these things are going to be poured upon him. The little sins that, that go on, the lying, the gossip, and the criticism, the backbiting. All those things being poured upon him. And he says, I, I, I just can't do this. And he walks out of the garden. And there they are sleeping. He wakes them up. Stay with me, boys. He goes back in and he prays again the same prayer. God, I don't know if I can handle this. Now blood is popping from his poor heads. Sweat is coming out of him. He's feeling the pressure. He goes back out again. He says, guys, stay with me. And he goes back in and he prays again. It didn't flood once. It didn't flood twice. But now the third time, peace came over him. It's over. I give. I give. I know this is why you sent me. My blood will flow. The sin will be on me. All the things I know is going to happen. Father, they're going to beat me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to mock me. That guy sleeping out there is going to deny me three times. The one back over to the other place, I can hear him coming with swords. He's going to betray me. But nevertheless, nevertheless, say it with me, nevertheless, not my will. But yours be done. And then he walks over to the guys and he wakes them. No, 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 no. Stay back, Jerry. You're getting ahead of yourself. I know, I'm in a hurry. Okay. He goes and looks at him and he says, Boys, sleep on now. That's what he said. Sleep. I'm not going to wake you up. This has been a hard night on me. It's going to be a hard night on you. And in my mind's eye, I see Peter, James, and John laying there. They're asleep. You get on the nods. You know, when the preacher ain't good. Or sometimes he ain't got nothing to do with the preacher. You stayed up too late on Saturday night. That was Peter, James, and John. Died now. There they were. James laid out. John laying on his chest, listening to his heartbeat. Peter down there, James's feet, he got him snugged up next to his face. Like that right there, toes right up near his nose. That's Peter. He always had feet stuck in his mouth. <laughs> Sleeping. Jesus walks over and looks at him. I'm speculating. But he says to them, to himself, James, you sleep. You're the first guy going to lose your head. You're the first guy going to die. I'll see you in heaven soon. And sure enough, they took his head not long after the resurrection. He looks at John. He says, John, you're my beloved. You're not going to die like they're going to die. You're going to die naturally. But I'm afraid they're going to pour hot bullet oil over you. And it's going to scar your body, son. And every time you look at the, the blisters that heal... The scars that form, you're going to remember the price you paid for loving me. And they're going to put you on an island called Patmos. But you hang on, because I'm going to show up and talk over a revelation with you. I got another book we need to write. Peter, Peter, Peter. My son, 
When you get old, they're going to lead you where you don't want to go. And they're going to crucify you upside down. You three love me, and I know it. And I love you. And in that place, he wakes them up when Judas comes up the side. Peter jumps up. He's beside himself. He's dreaming. He's Iron Man or something. He yanks out his sword and flies it through the night. Malchus's ear flies off. You know the story. Hits the ground. 600 swords, swords, swords go out. <laughs> Peter's sitting there. It's a bad moment. The truth is, Malchus could live without an ear, but Peter can't live without a neck. So Jesus picks the ear up, stuck it back on Malchus's head. You know if it had been me, I'd have stuck it under his arm. <laughs> he had never forgot that moment. I bet when Jesus went to the cross, Malchus was pulling on his earlobe. What a miracle. This is a, this is a wicked guy. This is a guy guilty of murder, to be murdered. Mm. That moment, it hits me that under pressure, and I'll say this, and I mentioned to the guys, the hardest thing about dealing with the flood to me was this. There were people that could get offended because I wasn't able to get to them or others weren't able to get to them or we worked together, something happened. You by got to be careful with your sword. Not to let it fly and not to offend others. And if you do get offended, learn how to shake it off quickly. Amen. Because the ears fly. So he takes care of him and he surrenders himself. The word was nevertheless. Everybody say, nevertheless. nevertheless. See, in life, you don't know how. His human nature, he didn't want to go through it. His nature, he didn't want to suffer. He didn't want to handle all this, but he had a nevertheless. Yet, because of the power of this one word, you and I enjoy the presence of God. I've always said that in that garden, that's where Jesus died. It wasn't on the cross. It was there where he gave up. It was there that he made a decision, nevertheless. And because of the power of nevertheless, amen, you and I, we have amazing grace that God has blessed us with. Father, my humanity desires any other way possible than this. Yet in spite of all this, nevertheless, when I look at all the things that are ahead of us, Jimmy, again, your daycare floods. Nevertheless, them kids need a place to go. So you get up and do it again. If it just been isolated, we'd figure out a way to pack up and move out. It's not that way. Man, it, it got from here to Winnie, Texas, 43 inches of rain in a day there. A lot of people went through it. Amen. So you, you got to button down and you got to decide, you know, even though I, I may not have my, uh, my, my house like I had it before, may not have my vehicles like I had it before, may not have, there, there are people that got dislocated last, I see Jessica Hatcher over here, uh, during the hurricane, she was blown all the way to Arizona, amen, and now she's back and then boom, here it goes again. Amen. Sometimes you got to get in line and say, nevertheless, nevertheless, I'm going to stay with it. Nevertheless, I'm not going to, and in, in your Christian walk, you're going to hit places that are going to be difficult and hard, amen, and you're going to say to yourself, Jesus, I sang this song, I trust in you, I trust in you, and yet in through all that, things still happen, and you've got to keep on trusting, and you've got to say, I said you've got to say, Nevertheless. you ain't saying it loud enough. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, God, I'm going to go, in spite of all this, I ain't quitting. We've come too far, we work too hard, we're not giving up. Stand with me. I'm going to give God a praise in here one more time. We get back to the other campus and we start over again. I have no idea of the timetable. But I'm so thankful for this. If we have to, we'll put chairs in the front. We'll put chairs up here. But don't quit coming. Don't give me that. And I, know, I know there's a need for holywild.tv. I understand that. But we need this. We need this togetherness. Amen. As we move through this rest of this month and, and, and move into October toward our conference, stay together. Help one another. Call one another. Amen. Heads bowed just for a moment, eyes closed.
This one word can change the dialogue. You can be upset with a parent who's asking you to do something. And then you look at them and say, nevertheless, I'll let down the net. Nevertheless, I'll do that, whatever you ask. You can be upset with an employer, but nevertheless. You can be upset with your pastor, but nevertheless. Nevertheless. It looks like the loss of something, but nevertheless. It can change everything. It changes situations. It, it, it eventually can change an entire city and a nation. And yes, even the world, when Jesus said nevertheless. That word is so powerful. So whatever your situation, it's up to you today to add the word to your life. Nevertheless. Mm. Mm. Pastor, they said, I got cancer. Nevertheless, I trust you. I had a mother call me this week. Her 12-year-old son was incarcerated. Nevertheless, life will throw curves at you. Nevertheless, if you've been away from God, would you put your hand up right now? You've just been away from Him. One, two, three, three, four, five hands already up. Let's put your hand up. You've been away from Him. You know what I'm talking about. You felt some distance doing your own thing. Let's pray together. It's me again, Jesus. I'm in need of mercy and grace. I need to be rescued. You know my life, my attitude. I want to be born again. So as I say, nevertheless, to my old life, waiting on my new, I'm believing you for your power, your strength. Turn me around. Clean up my mind, my mouth, my walk. Help me love you with all my heart, my soul, my strength. I repent. Wash me. Forgive me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on now. Give God praise. Anything we got in that bookstore that you need to help you with your Christian walk, stop back there and get it. We got Bibles, you can have it. We got tapes, CDs, whatever. Go ahead and take it. There was a day, Angela, we used to sell CDs and tapes, all that stuff. We had a little bookstore. Now everything's online. So now that you're watching it online, it ain't free. It cost us to put this online. So somewhere online is a button. Where you can give of your tithe and your offering and be a blessing to this ministry. Amen. Be seated just for a brief moment. Our servant leaders come up.